So today's uh, topic allotted to me is meeting the unmet need in non-small cell lung cancer patients with met exon 14 alterations. And in the next 15 or 20 minutes or so, we'll just go through uh, the role of met exon inhibition in non-small cell lung cancer and the outcomes in these patients. Uh, so, so this is the uh, Globocan data on the incidence of lung cancer in our, uh, in, our, in the world today. And we know that NSCLC is the most, most common type of cancer. Dr. Shivam also discussed in his talk uh, prior to this, that most of the cases now we are seeing is NSCLC with adenocarcinoma as the predominant histology. And we also know that tumors are found amongst the non-small cell uh, lung cancers. And adenocarcinoma is again, uh, one of the, where you find most of the mutations. So we go, come on, come to the MET exon 14 skip alterations or the MET gene mutations that are seen. And just to understand a uh, background about MET and how it, its role in cancer. So basically MET is a tyrosine kinase, which you can see is on the cell surface on the receptor. And it's a receptor for the hepatocyte growth factor. So MET is a uh, a transmembrane, uh, it's a protein, basically it has a transmembrane domain, an intracellular domain and an extracellular domain, just like all the tyrosine kinase receptors. And once there is binding of its ligand, which is HGF, there is downstream pathway activation. There's autophosphorylation of this intracellular part of the MET protein. And then there is activation of three major pathways, that is the RAS, RAS ERK, MAPK pathway, the PI3, uh, K A K T path pathway and the Jack Stat pathway, like you can see on the screen here, and this leads to multiple downstream actions, which lead to cell proliferation, increase increase in survival of the cells, and increase in metastasis of the cancer cells. So, what happens in MET mutated cancers, and what are the MET mutations that we can see? So, any alteration in the MET gene, including the MET exon fourteen, what happens is the MET signaling pathway gets disrupted. So there are different kinds of mutation that we see. The common, uh, some being, one being the MET exon 14, which I will discuss later. Some include MET overexpression or amplification of the MET gene. All this in the end lead to increase MET activation of the downstream pathways and then lead to oncogenesis. So it is an oncogenic driver. So what we know is that the MET gene codes for the MET protein and this MET protein has a ligand, which is HGF. Now, when there are mutations in the exon 14 of the MET gene, that results in an abnormal MET protein that is created. And as a result of this, the MET protein doesn't get degraded. So we know that there is a juxtamembrane domain, which has a part which binds to a ubiquitin ligase enzyme, which helps in degradation of this MET protein. And when this mutation occurs, there's a truncated or a shortened protein that is created. And the part that binds to the ubiquitin see. So as a result, this MET receptors do not, a lot of them accumulate on this cells. And this is the way the oncogenesis takes place in MET uh, mutated tumors. So in lung cancer, MET mutations can be seen in three to 4% of patients. So it is not the common mutation that we see. However, it is important to identify this because MET targeted therapy will uh, uh, significantly impact outcomes in these patients. And as we know that MET mutated lung cancer from a lot of retrospective and other study data, they seem to do poorly on chemotherapy and immunotherapy. And uh, in, the outcomes are significantly improved when we target the MET. So again, this is what I said, the clinical activity of immunotherapy remains suboptimal in, patient, in lung cancers, which have these MET-14 alterations. And uh, that is the importance of uh, identifying MET in non-small cell lung cancer and treating it. So most guidelines, including the NCCN, recommend this basic uh, panel of uh, testing for oncogenic drivers in non-small cell uh, lung cancer. But the practice varies in different parts of the world, depending on the access to the testing facilities or therapy. And EGFR, ALK, ROS, BRAF, KRAS, RET, NTRK, and MET exon 14 skipping mutation all have drugs approved for its uh, target. So like we all know in our clinical practice, we often see that there is an unmet need to detect rare mutations. It's often that it's not detected. And uh, this is one study which uh, analyzed the number of patients who had complete biomarker testing 
uh, in patients for these eight identified biomarkers for non-small cell ca cancer. And what here, this study was done in the West. And even here, only 20% of patients had complete tissue genotyping. And we know in our country, in resource poor settings, this is far less. So international guidelines are slowly now beginning to re recommend upfront testing for MET alterations because of the availability of MET uh, targeting drugs. And like I discussed before, uh, this Kaplan Maya, as you can see, the MET exon negative and the MET exon 14 mutated patients. There is a difference in survival where the mutated patients uh, do worse than the patients without these mutations. So again, uh, the benefit of targeting MET those who received a MET inhibitor had a higher median OS as those who never received a MET inhibitor. Now, this is a retrospective data, but this has been also tested uh, prospectively in randomized tracks. So now coming to MET testing, or how do we know any patient with non-small cell lung cancer has a MET alteration? So as we know, tissue testing, that is testing on tissue biopsies is the gold standard, but MET testing can be done both on tissue or liquid biopsies. In the various trials that I will discuss subsequently, including the vision trial uh, for tepotinib, they allowed testing both on tissue as well as liquid biopsy. And uh, there was testing on both the circulating DNA, RNA from the tissue, or again, DNA or RNA from tissue biopsies. And in the vision trial, uh, these three platforms, that is the Garden360 platform for the liquid biopsy and Oncomine Focus assay was used for tissue biopsy, which allowed RNA testing on the FFP tissue. And the LC Scrum uh, study assay, which was predominantly used in uh, Japan, was so Again, uh, how do we decide and CF, the differences between CFDNA and CTC? Uh, CFDNA refers to the DNA that is in the circulation and it is elevated in tumors. And of course, the CFDNA concentrations and the levels vary on the uh, type of the tumor, the disease uh, stage and uh, the treatment the patient is on. And here we can analyze both the DNA and the microRNA. CTCs are uh, uh, very widely, and again, they are not suitable for long-term storage, but you can still analyze, uh, look for mutations in this circulating tumor cells. So again, just to uh, summarize uh, what I discussed so far, uh, identifying rare driver mutations in non-small cell cancer is important because patients will benefit from targeted therapy and different methodologies are available and they're likely to evolve and improve. And now NGS is being used more and more in the first line. We know metaxon 14 skipping mutations, which are seen uh, do poorly. Both tumor tissue and liquid biopsy uh, are used for detecting the MET exon 14 skip mutations and other MET uh, amplification uh, in the in non-small cell lung cancer. Again, tumor tissue is uh, the gold standard, but liquid biopsy may be used in places where we can't get a tumor tissue. Now coming to tepotinib and its role in MET exon 14 mutated uh, non-small cell lung cancer. So tepotinib uh, is a drug, basically it is a small molecule TKI, like many of the small molecule TKIs which are already in use. Uh, and it is designed to target both the MET exon 14 mutated cancers and those with MET amplification. So today I'll be discussing the vision study, which was a study which evaluated the efficacy of tepotinib in patients with non-small cell cancer harboring MET alterations. And uh, this was a randomized phase two trial. And if you look at the inclusion criteria here, stage 3B or 4 non-small cell lung cancer with EGFR or ALK mutations negative, that is patients with EGFR and ALK mutations were not included. All histologies were included. And they had to have a MET exon 14 skip alteration, uh, either on a liquid or a tissue biopsy. Patients were relatively fit. They were PS0 or 1. And any line of therapy that is newly diagnosed or patients with a prior two lines of therapies and including prior immunotherapy were al allowed in this trial. And they received tepotinib, which is an oral uh, tablet, which was given 500 milligrams once a day till disease progression or intolerable toxicity or patients withdrew consent. Now, they had an initial cohort A, which has been published in NEGM last year. And then they had an expansion cohort, that is cohort C, for met exon 14 skip mutation NSCLC. And there is also a small cohort which they have included about uh, for met amplified patients. We will discuss the results of cohort A and C that is specific to met exon 14 skip mutations. 
So uh, this is the number of patients that were included, 275 uh, total patients with the MET exon 14 skip mutations. And uh, the number of patients who had treat were treatment naive, that is those who are being treated in the first line setting were 137 and 138 patients had received prior treatment. This was a phase two study and the primary endpoint was objective response rate and resist version 1.1 was used. And this was done by independent review committee. And there were secondary endpoints such as survival, PFS, OS, and safety analysis. So again, uh, this was a study which was designed with the clinical practice in mind. That is keeping in mind a lot of times in our clinical practice, we are not able to get this gold standard tissue uh, because of uh, the limitations with biopsy being invasive, patients not being willing, or the list, uh, the complications or difficulties in obtaining a rebiopsy. And they allowed patients with tissue biopsy, liquid biopsy, and the combined population, which included patients with tissue and liquid biopsy or tissue or liquid biopsy. So let's uh, come to the baseline characteristics, which includes the patients included in the study. And if you look at MET exon 14 skip mutation non-small cell lung cancer, overall you will see in most studies that the patients are older than the standard uh, general population, general non-small cell cancer population. And if you look at this, most of the patients were over 70 years. So the median age only was 72 years in overall, and it was 74 years in the newly diagnosed and 71 nearly in the uh, a, a group of previously treated patients. So it is a relatively elderly patient cohort. Uh, again, 80 approximately 80% of patients were more than 65 years old. Uh, there is an equal male-female distribution, so there is no predominance, gender predominance. And of course, this, uh, this study was conducted in the West and in East, extreme East Asia, that is Japan, Korea, and China. So uh, two-thirds of the patients were from the Western population. Patients were uh, fit, so the 0 to 1 PS, and 80% of the patients were adenocarcinomas. They allowed well-controlled brain meds, so you can see there are patients with brain meds at baseline. Overall, it is around 18.5% in the overall population, and 175 in those who are newly diagnosed, and around 19% in those who were previously treated. So brain meds were allowed if they were controlled. You can see that targeting the MET exon 14 skip mutation with uh, tepotinib uh, showed beautiful tumor responses. Uh, this is the waterfall plot, which is showing uh, responses in treatment naive patients. So you can see the orange here shows partial responses and you can see almost 90, uh, over 90% had tumor shrinkage. So these are all the patients with the partial response. These were the ones with the stable disease. And uh, this is a very good response for a patient with lung cancer. And also, it's not just the response that was seen that was good, but it was also the duration of response, which was 32 months in the newly diagnosed or the treatment naive population. And a PFS median was 15.3 months in this population of treatment naive patients. So not only is the response, uh, there are good deep responses, it is also a durable uh, response. So they were robust and lasting uh, responses to treatment in the first line setting. So just to summarize, overall response rates, what uh, was noted was 54.7%. So uh, complete response or partial response was seen in half the patients. Uh, 32 months, that is nearly three years, the response were durable. 15.3 months was the median PFS and 29.7 months was the median OS. Now we know, looking at this data, that in these patients, if this MET was not detected and they were treated with chemotherapy alone, our overall average overall survival in lung cancer with chemotherapy ranges to around eight to 10 months. And you can see that this is far better than what we can achieve with chemotherapy. Again, now looking at the group of people who had received uh, tepotinib in the second line or third line setting, Again, you can see there is a good response, partial response is seen uh, in these group of patients as well. So we see that these patients do respond. The duration of response is also uh, good. It is around 10.1 months with a PFS of 11.1 months, but it is lower than what is achieved in the treatment naive setting. Another thing to note is that uh, tepotinib had consistent sensitive uh, sensitivity to tepotinib therapy, that is tumors were sensitive irrespective of the method of detection. That is whether you detect metaxon 14 skip mutations in the tumor in the liquid biopsy or in the solid uh, tumor tissue, there is a response to tepotinib 
in the treatment naive, you can see it is both have 54% and here also it is 47 and 43%. There is not much significant difference. Again, the median PFS is uh, comparable in the treatment naive group here, it's 15 and 11, and it is on tissue biopsy and liquid biopsy, it's 8.5. So there is uh, efficacy in both the groups. So which is to say that in case we can't get tissue for NGS for metaxon testing, we may also consider liquid biopsy if the facility is available. Again, uh, this is another uh, uh, um, slide which shows the efficacy of tepotinib in both the first line and the second line and beyond setting. So the Kaplan Maya, as you can see on the right here, the purple line is the treatment naive group. And this is the previously treated group. And uh, you can see that there is efficacy in both the settings if you look at uh, the uh, treatment with tepotinib. So if you look at treatment knife patients, the objective response rate was 54%. The median PFS was 10.4 and the OS was 17.6. And in the previously treated uh, patients, again, the PFS was 11 and the OS was 19.9. So um, again, Asian patients, which were a smaller cohort, that is around a one third of the patients uh, in the study also responded and had benefit with the drug, which was similar to what was seen in the overall population. And with Asians, I mean to uh, say Asians, that is Japanese, Chinese, and Koreans, uh, Indians were not a part of the study. So there might be slight racial differences in our responses as well. Uh, so tepotinib showed clinical activity in patients, uh, similarly in Asians as well as non-Asians. So that was, was also similar. Now coming to brain mats, we know that oncogenic driver mutation positive patients have a higher incidence of brain metastasis. And now more and more trials are allowing the use of uh, inclusion of patients with brain mats in trials as compared to the older studies. And if you look at the uh, systemic response of tepotinib in patients with brain mats, it was durable and it was robust. And you can look at this uh, uh, these images on the right, which show the brain mats and the response to therapy, like at baseline, our target lesion of 11.1 millimeters. At six weeks, it was 5.8 and it is uh, resolved, it was a CR at week 36. So we know that there is intracranial activity and brain mets do respond to tepotinib. Coming to the toxicity, we all know that although these are oral medications which patients can take at home, uh, receptor tyros kin tyrosine kinase inhibitors in various tumors have their own toxicities and uh, we need to learn how to manage them. So the most common toxicity seen with MET inhibitors, uh, including tepotinib, is peripheral edema. So if you look at this incidence overall, it was 65% in patients. So two-thirds of patients will present with peripheral edema. And uh, it is seen across all age groups. Uh, and it, it seems to be that the older the patient, the, the percentage of patients developing edema is slightly higher. The other common toxicities that we see is nausea, diarrhea, hypoalbuminemia, and increase in creatinine, constipation, and fatigue. So how do these uh, toxicities impact on the compliance with treatment? So this, um, this table on the left shows the uh, dose reductions, temporary interruptions, and permanent discontinuations. And you can look at the overall incidence uh, in the patients below 65. It's a little, uh, it's lower as you grow, go, go to the older age group, a slightly, slight increase in the incidence of uh, dose reductions as well as interruptions and discontinuations. So I think older patients, like with all other therapies, need to be closely monitored and might require more dose reductions as compared to younger patients. The advantages of uh, tepotinib over other MET inhibitors include a simpler dosing regimen that is just a once daily regimen, which improves compliance. Uh, again, also fewer discontinuations. So around 14% of AEs, that is adverse events, led to discontinuations. And a lot of the adverse events, including peripheral edema, nausea, fatigue, and diarrhea, are manageable and they can be managed easily with simple dose modifications. And uh, to remember the most common AE that was peripheral edema. So peripheral edema, though it is very common, it is the severity or the grade three or higher peripheral edema leading to discontinuation or uh, complications was very low. Only 10.7 patients had grade three or higher. And because of edema, only four patients had to discontinue therapy. 
so important in a palliative setting and in a disease which is metastatic as like we all know is not just improvement of outcomes we also want to look at the toxicity profile and the quality of life and uh, they use the urtc qlq uh, c30 and the lc13 question as to assess the quality of life in these patients so this is the quality of life uh, uh, that you can see and uh, this shows the time to de deterioration of quality of life so what they look at is the baseline quality of life and how long it takes for the patient's quality of life to deteriorate and uh, this is in two different age groups that is younger patients less than 75 years and older than more than 75 years that is two groups that they looked at and you can see more or less that the quality of life after about a year it stabilizes and there is hardly any deterioration uh, patients only had mild cough dyspnea and pain and there doesn't seem to be much of a difference in the age group that is almost uh, the everywhere the curves are overlapping so probably younger and older patients the drug doesn't deteriorate the quality of life more in older patients it doesn't appear to be so so we can see that there's a stabilization of the quality of life of patients around 9 to 10 months of therapy and that is maintained till the around 3 years so it is a good option for pal in a palliative setting because it doesn't cause the uh, deterioration of the quality of life in these elderly patients so to summarize uh, tepotinib is a simple oral once daily regimen which can be used in patients with met exon 14 skip mutation positive non small cell lung cancer uh, in the first line setting, it has an objective response rate of more than 50% with 90% tumor shrinkage and a very long duration of response of nearly three years. And uh, it's once daily oral dosing. Um, it is also a flexible uh, inclusion criteria that is the allowed liquid or tissue biopsy. Toxicities are seen, but they are manageable with dose reduction and the incidence of very a severe grade 3 or higher toxicities leading to dose discontinuation is less. We also saw that the quality of life deterioration uh, did not happen. It was stabilized after a few months of therapy and both older patients that is more than 75 years also did not have a significant negative impact on the quality of life. So with this I would like to conclude. Thank you and I'll hand it back over to Amit.